Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The public beta of SpaceX Starlink internet service has begun. YouTube DL has been hit with a DMCA takedown by the RIAA. Ubuntu Groovy Gorilla adds Raspberry Pi as a first-class citizen. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption for all for free, though there are caveats and we'll tell you what they are. And a NASA spacecraft, spacecraft successfully touched down on an asteroid to collect a sample. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. The public beta space of SpaceX Starlink internet service has begun. SpaceX has begun sending email invitations to Starlink's public beta and will charge beta users $99 per month, plus a one-time fee of $499 for the user terminal, mounting tripod, and router. The emails are being sent to people who previously registered interest in the service on the Starlink website. SpaceX is calling it the better-than-nothing beta, perhaps partly because the Starlink satellite service will be most useful to people who can't get cable or fiber broadband. But the email also says, as you can tell from the title, we are trying to lower your initial expectations. The email reads, expect to see data speeds vary from 50 to 150 megabits per second and latency from 20 to 40 milliseconds over the next several months as we enhance the Starlink system. There will also be brief periods of no connectivity at all. As we launch more satellites, install more ground stations and improve our networking software, data speed latency and uptime will improve dramatically. For latency, we expect to achieve 16 to 19 milliseconds by summer 2021. There is apparently no data cap. A Starlink mobile app to help beta users set up and manage the surface also just went live on Apple's App Store and Google Play. Elon Musk recently said that the public beta will be for the northern U.S. and hopefully southern Canada. SpaceX plans to provide Starlink to a school district in Texas in early 2021, but that doesn't mean the public beta is available to anyone in the south. The wait may not be too long, though, as SpaceX has said it will reach near global coverage of the populated world by 2021. You know, that Starlink story is an interesting one. Uh, because for so long we have been hearing about this project, mm -hmm. hearing about how it's going to change the face of the globe with providing internet, high-speed internet to, you know, unreachable areas. So it, it's interesting that they're offering this beta version to lower expectations. That's totally contrary to what companies do. They want to heighten expectations. Mm. So why would they take that approach when? Quite frankly, if you don't have access to internet, even to hear that you can get, you know, 50 meg download speeds is phenomenal. Sure. Like yeah. that, that, that to me is great. I mean, but it's satellite. You expect that there's going to be downtime. You expect that there's going to be interference from weather. So I, I don't understand why they would call this about lowering expectations. Like what were people thinking they were going to get? Well, I mean, we know that it's meant to be really, really fast. And they're saying yeah. it's not yet there. No, of so course. let's try it out, but no, it's not yet there. Yeah. So I think you know they have to set expectations, perhaps, yeah. to avoid you know complaints and things like that. But I think about like my, it's it's hard for us to fathom if we live in a city that there are places still that don't have high speed internet. I, I, I'm literally thinking about my church. Yeah. We are. Yeah, you're just on the outskirts. We're the we're less than a kilometer mm -hmm. from the edge of Barrie. We cannot get anything internet wise other than sure your basic dsl our old studio studio oh, d brutal same deal yeah my father-in-law is using lte internet at home because they do not have high speed internet where they live that's what we have at the church and that's unreal 200 bucks a month just to have basic internet just for basic lte internet man so yeah. i mean like this starlink for the price it's going to be could be a great so, option yes, for, us. for you. For you, then, in that case, or for my father-in-law, it's a great option, and it's probably going to be better than what they currently have. So maybe setting the expectations low in that, you know, those of us who have gig internet 
aren't, yeah, okay, aren't going enough. out and and signing up for the new you know this is the latest and greatest from spacex right so it's going to be the best well they're setting the expectations low purposefully so that it's the right market yeah i, 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 I guess if you're in a city where you've got that high speed but if you have nothing yes i mean what they're offering for speeds is phenomenal it is yeah. so i mean i'm i'm excited at first i wasn't sure how i felt about this project when mm -hmm. i first heard about it because i'm like oh he just wants to space the debris <laughs> but, yeah but now that i'm starting to see it roll out i'm getting excited about it. but what's interesting is that it's upper us possibly lower canada for their beta we'll start. testing why not beta test in like a low cert like pick somewhere along the equator of africa maybe you know, like some remote. Well, it makes sense though that they would want to test it in, in a, a place where. Area. Well, think of it this way: if if it went down, I have something else to fall back on. Yeah, I have the four G infrastructure to fall back on if I needed right. to. So you know, maybe that has something to do with it. I mean, we're speculating here, but there that there are be. so many thoughts. Yeah, but hey, how how does something like Starlink affect you? Is it something that would be better than what you have, or is mm -hmm. it a severe downgrade? Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. But I think in a lot of cases, this is going to bring high-speed internet to areas that currently don't have it. And not yes. only that, Jeff, but we've hit on it in the past when we've talked about Starlink, and that's that in an event of natural disaster or infrastructure um, issues, it's an opportunity to still receive good, solid internet, yes. high-speed internet that is not reliant on things like towers. Yes. Right. No, what one of the things that will be interesting is because I mean this is not new. Like satellite internet is already here. Well, good satellite internet well, is new. That's <laughs> that's the challenge here. Is uh, I mean I used to another iteration of my working life. I was a uh, a ser uh, recognized installer for satellite internet. Um, so I have an inner working of or an, an inner understanding of how it works, and it was quite uh cumbersome mm. and unreliable yeah i mean the dish moves just a slight bit from wind right and you're out mm -hmm. so i'm really interested to see how starlink's internet works in that regard and if a little bit of wind is going to knock it out or if it's a more stable platform mm -hmm. time will tell mm -hmm. maybe the beta test will show some results so we'll see over the next couple months mm -hmm. we've got to head back to becca YouTube DL has been hit with a DMCA takedown by the Recording Industry Association of America. The RIAA has issued a DMCA takedown on the open source project YouTube DL on their GitHub repository. This is done under the guise of protecting content creators from having their ad revenue stolen. YouTube DL, however, is often used by archivists and users who suffer from a slow internet connection in order to allow them to watch the content. There are, of course, those that use it to circumvent ads, but we can't pretend ad blockers don't exist, which accomplish the same goal with less effort. So are ad blockers next on the list? Here at Category 5, we're content creators. We post our videos on YouTube and we depend on the revenue it generates. But like the Electronic Frontier Foundation points out, we believe YouTube DL is a legitimate tool with a world of lawful uses. See, we know we have viewers who are watching in areas where internet just isn't very good. We've heard from troops who watch our show in their tents while at war. We have fans who live in areas where high-speed internet just doesn't exist yet. So we make sure they have access to our content for free with the hope that they will support us through Patreon if they're able. We received an email from a viewer this week asking us how they can watch our show while circumventing YouTube. Is it surprising that we, the very content creators who rely on the re revenue YouTube provides, responded by providing BitTorrent files of all 13 past seasons, plus recommended the download button found on the page of every episode we publish on our website? As content creators, we understand the need for res revenue. It costs a lot of money to do what we do. But for the RIAA to demand YouTube DL be shut down seems shady. The Electronic Frontier Foundation fights these types of battles on behalf of open source projects. You can help protect projects like YouTube DL by donating at EFF.org. Last week, Canonical released the latest intermediate version of Ubuntu 20.10, Groovy Gorilla, which for the first time adds first-class platform support for the Raspberry Pi 4. 
Groovy Gorilla itself is a pretty typical interim release, offering an updated GNOME version with lots of bug fixes and small feature additions. Support has also been added for Windows Active Directory in the Ubiquiti OS installer itself. And while it has been possible for some time to install Ubuntu on Raspberry Pi hardware, up until now that has been strictly a community effort. The Pi itself ships with Raspberry Pi OS, a Debian-based distribution whose origins began with the Pi community, but which has since been officially adopted and supported by the Raspberry Pi Foundation itself. While Canonical added the Pi as a supported platform in 20.04 earlier this year, that support was only for the Ubuntu server distribution, not desktop. With 20.10 Groovy Gorilla, Canonical has added full desktop support for the Pi 4. Martin Wimpress, Canonical's Director of Engineering for the Ubuntu Desktop, says this means the Pi is now a first-class citizen. Canonical guarantees the same level of integration, QA, and support from kernel to user space that it does for a standard PC. The entire Ubuntu software repository is available and supported on the Pi. Of course, that's other than architecture-specific packages that start with names like i386 and are therefore not compatible with the Raspberry Pi's ARM processor. If you'd like to install Ubuntu 20.10 desktop on the Pi, you'll need a 4GB or 8GB Raspberry Pi. As long as you meet the hardware requirements, the install is a breeze. Ubuntu 20.10 desktop is an option in the standard Raspberry Pi imager now. The imager itself is available for Linux, Windows, or Mac platforms. To get up and running, insert a 4GB plus micro SD card, open the imager, choose Ubuntu 20.10, and click Write. A few minutes later, you'll be able to boot the official Ubuntu 20.10 for Raspberry Pi 4. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption for all for free, though there are caveats, and we'll tell you what they are. And a NASA spacecraft successfully touched down on an asteroid to collect a sample. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. This week I've got some really good news for you. Um, if we look at the market, by the time I'm recording this year the price of Bitcoin is at 13,128, uh, which is equivalent to a 2.3% increase in the last 24 hours and 14% in the last seven days. I think that's fantastic news and one reason why I believe that is if we compare it to the stock exchange, the US stock exchange, or the gold price, then there is a decoupling happening. Um, it is not confirmed yet. Uh, that will take some time, but at least there is a decoupling at the moment. This is the chart, uh, chart since uh, beginning of October. And uh, the red line is the red uh, curve is the US stock exchange. The blue is the gold price. And so you see there's a significant gap uh, especially since yesterday where we had a huge drop in the stock exchange in the US stock exchange uh, to uh, Bitcoin. So I think that's that's great news. It's to be expected because it's a complete uh, different asset commodity. And so let's see what will happen. The other good news is uh, PayPal. Uh, PayPal decided to get involved in cryptocurrencies. And so you can buy now uh, some cryptocurrencies on their platform. And the great news is because they have got over 340 million users. And you can, uh, by using PayPal, pay for services and goods. And you can now use, for example, Bitcoin to pay for services and goods. But at least that they're offering this here to this huge community is, I think, fantastic news. Also, one that I have to take with a smile is our friends from JP Morgan, uh, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. And in 2017, Jamie Dimon, their CEO, said that Bitcoin is a fraud and will blow up. He also said that he, if he finds somebody in his organization uh, trading uh, cryptocurrencies, that person will be fired on the spot. Now, like in politics, things can change significantly and dramatically. And so this is, uh, happened. Uh, this was published uh, two days ago 
uh, by JP Morgan, uh, where they are now saying Bitcoin has considerable upside as it's better competes with gold as an alternative currency. I find that fantastic news because an organization embedded in the old system like JP Morgan suddenly changes their opinion 180 degrees is for me extremely bullish. Not financial advice, but for me that's a bullish sign. So, um, yeah, uh, one thing I'd like to focus on is it's a question that a lot of people are asking us in regards to private keys and public keys. Um, so I'd like to spend a few minutes on that subject. And for that, I pulled up a website called iancoleman.io because this is, uh, uses um, the, web, the, the content fantastically well. And uh, so there is somebody in Bitcoin or a team that came up with this process of how to convert uh, a, a private key into a public key and it expanded that. And now a lot of different cryptocurrencies are using the same process. And that's why it's called BIP39 or BIP44 because it's Bitcoin improvement protocol, but other uh, uh, currencies are using that. So I just gen clicked on generated on 24 words. And so out of a repository, uh, the system generated 24 words. And that, those are the words that you need to remember. Uh, when you generate a, a wallet, for example, you create a new wallet, uh, the wallet will uh, generate those 24 words. And those are the ones that you have to remember because everything derives from those 24 words. So with a little bit, this little bit technical here, but from those 24 words, we deduct the private key. From that private key, we deduct the public key, and that public key then generates the address. Yeah, so, and the reason that is done is that there is no way in the world that you can get back to the private key. That's why a cryptocurrency is so secure. Yeah, and so, what you do is you take the private key, you hash it. That's a special crypto, cryptographic process. And with that, you generate the public key. And the public key is hashed twice, and that generates the address. The reason that this is done is that there might be in future some computers that are able to uh, deduct from the public key the private key. They don't exist yet, but we're thinking well ahead in the future, and that's why we are using the address as the key that you uh, send to other people in case uh, you want to receive some Bitcoin or so. So... Uh, um, this is all the magic behind it. It's based on those 24 words. Those 24 words generate the private key. The private key generates the public key and the public key generates the address and address is what we use. And that is, that is used in many other, um, like here, uh, cryptocurrencies. They use the same, um, same process. Anyway, that's it uh, from me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please leave a like. It helps us. We need to grow. And um, yeah, come back next week. Thank you very much for watching. Bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency markets. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever-changing and always volatile. So only invest what you can afford to lose. Now here's Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Zoom has added end-to-end -end encryption to its video conferencing service at no additional cost for all users, whether they are paying subscribers or not. The feature has been long awaited given the service's massive adoption as a result of pandemic lockdowns, something that swung a spotlight on its patchy security. The company announced on Tuesday that the new feature is available now as a technical preview for the next 30 days and is looking for user feedback before rolling it out en masse. Zoom CISO Jason Lee gives kudos to Keybase who joined the company in May to develop the security feature, taking just six months to do so. Zoom says its end-to-end -end encryption will use 256-bit. AES GCM and a secure key exchange is performed beforehand to ensure only the participants on the call can decrypt each other's part of the conversations and no eavesdroppers, not even Zoom itself, can listen in. Zoom already encrypted some of its uh, communications, though it wasn't truly end to end until now. In order to use the end to end encryption, an account admin has to enable the feature.
Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption is limited to 200 participants, so for larger meetings where encryption may not be a needed feature, such as a public forum or a digital comic con, it can be disabled to allow more people to join. Other restrictions of the service are a lack of cloud recording and live transcription. Breakout rooms, polling, and one-to-one -one private chats are also unavailable when end-to-end -end encryption are on, as are live emojis. Perhaps the biggest caveat of all, though, is that each user must have the official Zoom client installed in order to participate, so browser-based participation will not be available for encrypted meetings. Third-party Zoom clients will also not work when end-to-end -end encryption is enabled. The feature is available on new releases of the Zoom software for Mac OS, Windows, Android, Linux, and iOS. After orbiting the near-Earth asteroid Bennu for nearly two years, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft successfully touched down and reached out its robotic arm to collect a sample from the asteroid's surface last week. The sample will be returned to Earth in 2023. To achieve this historic first for NASA, a van-sized spacecraft had to briefly touch down its arm in a landing site called Nightingale. The site is the width of a few parking spaces. The arm reached out to collect a sample, which could be between 2 ounces and 2 kilograms. Then the spacecraft backed away to safety. We have never done this before. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat, and covered with fine grain material. And by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag SAM, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample, and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. Everything went perfectly based on the data returned by the spacecraft, according to Dante Loretta, the mission's principal investigator and a professor at the University of Arizona Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He said he feels transcendent and the team is exuberant based on the current data. Loretta said in a statement, After over a decade of planning, the team is overjoyed at the success of today's sampling attempt. I look forward to analyzing the data and to determine the mass of sample collected. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're going to image the tag SAM head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're going to do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. Preliminary data show the sampling head touched Bennu's surface for approximately six seconds, after which the spacecraft performed a back away burn. Thomas Surbuchan, Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, said in a statement, A piece of primordial rock that has witnessed our solar system's entire history may now be ready to come home for generations of scientific discovery, and we can't wait to see what comes next. The mission, which stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, Regolith Explorer, launched in September 2016. Since arriving at Bennu, the spacecraft and its cameras have been collecting and sending back data and images to help the team learn more about the asteroid's composition and map out the best potential landing sites to collect samples. The main event of the mission is the Touch and Go Sample Collection event, or TAG, that occurred last week. The event took about four and a half hours total to unfold, and the spacecraft executed three maneuvers to collect the sample from Bennu, which could help scientists understand not only more about asteroids that could impact Earth, but also about how planets formed and life began.
Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and, subscri and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.